Well, I don't have to tell you that cardiovascular disease has moved so much and so fast. All the technologies, newer medications, newer interventions, and when you build a department, you really have to take a look at a comprehensive way of looking at it. And we've grown so much over the past few years since our inception, and we are a young department, if you will. So I don't think we, there is an area that we have not touched and built at this stage of the game. We're very proud of who you are, the work that you do. So from prevention all the way to various interventions and heart failure. So, And Dr. Sassman shared with you that we have this research affinity groups in red are the ones that touch cardiology. The others are either surgery, regeneration, vascular, critical care. Uh, and basically it is to share information, share resources, and also be accountable at the same time. The accountability is at the investigator level. This is for all heart and vascular centers, so it's not only for cardiology. Uh, quite a bit of good funding. Uh, we have a lot of research personnel. Uh, publications uh, certainly have exceeded 300 or so, and this is total also. For clinical trials on the left, more than 200, so you can imagine the burden at times on contract and, and IRB, but these have to grow to match the growth. A lot of publications, and quite a few of them are in highly impactful journals. So what I'm going to do now is go through each area just to give you a feel of what they're working on. So if, if you have an interest to collaborate, this is important for you. In imaging, you know, we have nuclear, we have cardiac CT, and in nuclear, a lot on blood flow. Amyloid is big nowadays. Sarcoidosis now with PET scanning and Dr. Al-Mala and his team. Incorporation of AI into, I mean, that's going to be huge really for imaging. Cardiac CT. Uh, ultra low dose calcium scoring, uh, as you know, we do FFR, you know, to, to assess uh, stenosis and dynamic CT endolique. Share with you that, that we're going to acquire a new CT scanner, uh, which is basically can see through stents and calcifications much better than before. So it's a great area for research for you to collaborate among now about this echocardiography, a lot of diastology, you know, and we're probably the leaders in diastology and strain. Um, there's a lot of collaboration among, uh, you know, the various modalities, cardiac MRI, big on valvular heart disease. If you take a look at each one of them in every area, I think we have been really all leading in this situation. I'll share with you that Jack, journal of the American College of Cardiology, chose the top picks from 2023, two of them were from our institution, uh, from Dr. Shah and Associates. Another thing is recognition. This is a national, very prominent award for Dr. Al Rifai for his work, and this is the Barry Zaret Investigator Award. Heart failure, a lot of a lot of investigation there, be it uh, new drugs, and this is uh, a recombinant fusion protein to improve heart function. It has multiple facets to it. Also, there is an intermittent SBC occlusion for acute decompensated heart failure and, uh, you know, uh, research regarding amyloidosis and a lot of collaboration with imaging. Uh, Dr. Cassie has really spearheaded work in CT imaging and transplant in uh, VAD and what is the optimal way of doing it, what are the, some of the risk factors in, in VAD. And also there are some gender disparities in VAD and people are addressing that. Another area of collaboration here beyond the heart and vascular center is with infectious diseases. And as you know, one of the complications of that is infections. So I think this is a very important collaborative that is uh, spearheaded by, by these uh, amazing investigators. Uh, this is important also, weaning from a bad. I know we don't think about it usually, but this is a, a collaborative, uh, really a, a uh, global registry for where can you wean and what are some of the indicators. On the basic sciences, uh, translational work, uh, Dr. Uh, Guha, uh, Dr. Bimaraj, and uh, uh, Guillermo Torre and the others are looking at various areas of, of heart failure. And I think there's one area of, of tremendous investigation, which is a nuclear tracer to try to detect pulmonary hypertension very early. In the area of structural heart disease and interventions, 
quite a few studies here looking at, and this is for coronary disease, uh, looking at acute myocardial infarction, uh, platelet aggregation, shock, et cetera. So this is of your area interested. And, you know, structural heart is really big in, in cardiology nowadays. So um, you think about TAVR usually for aortic stenosis, and this is actually the first study was finished. Uh, regarding aortic regurgitation. So these are usually not calcific valves and they are different, but I think the early data looks very promising. Uh, a lot of work uh, with, with Dr. Goel and Kleiman and the others uh, on mitral valve replacement. So instead of just repair, replacement. And uh, the new kid on the block is uh, tricuspid valves. As you know, it's very interesting that recently there was a tricuspid valve approved by the FDA, total replacement in addition to the edge-to-edge -edge repair. So we are quite involved in that. And one of the publications here uh, from Dr. Goel and, and his team was some of the predictors of hemodynamics after mitral tear and uh, the areas of prognosis. We were the first to do a trick valve cases in Texas and back in February. Uh, a lot of presentation nationally, plenary sessions at at the American College of Cardiology and the like. So, you know, very interesting. In adult congenital heart disease, I'll share with you that there is a patent already approved by Dr. Huey Lin and collaborators looking at how best to position uh, automatically, if you will, a catheter for deployment of valves, uh, patient-centered and PCORI grant applications, uh, importance of uh, looking at pregnancy outcome by Dr. Uh, Duarte, and a collaboration also with our imaging looking for D-flow uh, in patients with uh, Fontan or other congenital heart disease. Electrophysiology, very active. Um, this is a lot of collaboration with the basic sciences with Dr. Altamirano and uh, some uh, preclinical cath lab and actually some of the posters are looking at new interventions in this field. So besides a very clinical, busy practice, these investigators have been amazingly productive. And you could see in all these areas that they have amazing funding, NIH funded at least twice by Dr. Balderabano, DOD funded, and uh, R21 funding. So this is quite impressive. And last but not least is prevention and wellness. You don't have to read all this, read the red ones. These are the big topics. Coronary atherosclerosis research, Big data, digital health, and we'll talk about digital, uh, big, uh, big data and digital health in our discussion. Metabolic biomarkers research in initiative, developing tools for social drivers of health, which is really very important nowadays. Exposome and environmental health programs, particularly with the recruitment of Dr. Elkindi, who really is an a international leader in, in this area and uh, implementation science. So uh, this is also our collaborative with RICE, and we're fortunate to have the uh, head of uh, engineering and computation at RICE with us today on, on the panelist, but this is a very exciting area for AI and big data. Amazing funding. You could see in red the national extramural funding, most of it from the NIH, industry funding, and intramural funding. And last but not least is hopefully this year or, or at the beginning of next year, we will have a woman heart center. We already have funding for it and upcoming naming for the center um, before having it, although we have some of the building blocks. So I'm very excited about that and hopefully we can, we can uh, get our recruit that we have in mind. To finish, some accolades, other accolades besides the ones that I shared with you. Very proud that Dr. Patel, was the winner of the American Heart Association competition. Uh, Dr. Elkindi, who I just mentioned, also won the ACC 2023, and he is probably the singular one who won twice in a row ACC investigation uh, award. Uh, we mentioned the um, uh, auto ones, two auto ones for Dr. Valderabano in collaboration, one of them with Altamirano, and also a very innovative collaboration, auto one with Dr. Nasser and uh, Dr. Poundwell. And uh, two other things. This is, uh, you know, we've been very fortunate actually to have almost two per year clinical investigator awards. And this year, 
uh, Dr. Ari, and these are internal awards, as you know, Dr. Arifai and Dr. Avenatti, who just joined us. And quote, unquote, she was the role model application for a clinical education award. So that was, that was in the review, and it's really amazing. And as you know, within cardiology, I provide every year two chairs awards, 50K each, for young investigators or investigators who don't have you know, funding, including fellows. So this year's awardee were Dr. Cassie and Dr. Yusuf Sai. And last, Dr. Patel also was the President's Award for publication. Dr. Goel uh, was the innovator, uh, best innovator competition back in March. Going forward, as you noticed today, we will improve our processes for IRB in collaboration with IRB and contracting, enhance research activity through collaboration, various collaborations, enhance registries and big data, because this is the source of a lot of preliminary work that you could do, extend research and patient recruitment gradually through the system. We don't have that as much, and I think that would be an amazing source for having more patients, and uh, we will recruit more clinical investigators. So thank you. We kicked off this morning with Dirk Sossman. Yeah, it'd be nice to say this to him in person, but uh, Dirk, as we call him, you know, probably tells you a little bit about his management style, was recruited uh, way back here when the Baylor Methodist split occurred. He was like vice dean at Cornell, and he took over the physician's organization at that time, which is kind of who we all work for as faculty, uh, then took and became in charge of the research institute. Um, he tried to retire about three to four years ago, and we kind of press ganged him into staying on. But he is going to retire this time around, and the search committee has already begun. But I would say that if you look at the evolution, and he kind of outlined a lot of that, he's personally responsible for a huge amount of the of what has taken place here, both on the physicians' organization side and in the research side, and will be hugely miss. This is a major recruit that that, that is about to start to try and replace Dirk, and so. I really, he's been a friend, he's been a mentor, and he's been helpful to all of us. And so I just want to publicly say thank you very much to Dirk for doing that. Let me, now I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach and start off and go from basic science all the way through to full-blown integrated clinical operation and start off really with Trisha. Trisha asked a question earlier on. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about background and how we get to, to have an investigator like Trisha. Uh, she trained up at University of Toronto, where it's a big imaging center, particularly around MRI. Um, it's one of the reasons you kind of go around the country and you give lectures, because I met her when I was a visiting professor up there and told her about the wonderful imaging collaborations that we have here, the research core, and that really allowed us to attract and recruit Trisha down here. She wanted to do uh, half-time uh, basic science. We don't have that in surgery. Uh, and so really through these, uh, if you look around the corner, there's a picture with the CATS investigators. Karam Nasser is another example of that. It allowed us basically to support half of our time and to focus on the clinical operation. And I think you're going to see what the, how this reaps the reward of having somebody who's got the time to be able to focus on this. And so what I asked her to do is really outline some of the successful collaborations. And so if you want the details of this, you're going to have to basically uh, talk to Trisha and she's going to hang out. Uh, and, and talk a little bit about it. But to be honest with you, one of the things for a clinician is leverage what your clinical interest is and leverage that into the basic science. And so a lot of the studies which she's doing are really about preoperative imaging. Some of these patients end up with amputation. She's built a research group who will then image the leg, dissect out the blood vessels, sometimes perfuse the blood vessels, and sometimes do interventions on the blood vessel. And that's allowed us to it, you know, number one, companies will come along and tell you how wonderful the device is, and this is what they do with almost zero data. And so this has been able to, she's been able to build a model, probably the single best model in the world, which allows you to ask very basic questions about how these devices work, their efficacy, and to, to verify this. And so to do that, basically, you can see that she's got an enormous number of people she's got to communicate. In this case, Dr. Gu, looking at scanning electron microscopy of these blood vessels. Uh, if you look at the translational imaging center, because a lot of this goes from an operating room to translational imaging center and up to MITEI. And I want to make a plug for MITEI. MITEI's been a real struggle. Heart and vascular center, easy. Organizing MITEI has been a real challenge over the past few years. But I think that we've kind of gotten there. 
uh, to the point that uh, Dr. Valderabno called me up to say, I just want to compliment you on how well the mighty team is working. And I can't, because a lot of the EP work that's being done on animals is being done up in mighty. Well, that was music to my ears because this was not the calls that I was getting from him two to three years ago. Mighty is now free for internal education processes and for, if you're funded research, we're probably going to charge you for that, but it's very economically competitive now. And I think that the, the support structure that you get up there, the imaging that's up there is really second to none. And a lot of these things they see have depended upon this. Christoph Karmanek is the director of MRI down the Translational Imaging Center. And he's also been pivotal in pulling uh, Christoph and to develop some of the protocols for imaging these blood vessels, both in 3T and in 7T. The, one of the things that we kind of lack here is cardiovascular pathology. And so what they do have is excellent cardiovascular pathologists over at Texas Heart Institute. So Tricia essentially went off on a mission to actually find somebody who can help with the histological analyses of these blood vessels. So we're going all the way from clinical imaging to amplified imaging once the, the, the vessel has been harvested, to taking the vessels out, to doing interventions on the vessel, all the way to, uh, to having world-class pathologists who can actually help look at that. Also, obviously, she's inter interacting with um, Dr. Cook and a variety of his group. One of the new things, in fact, the Heart Center Grand Rounds this week was um, by a guy who was the national PI on deep venous arterialization. This is a whole new concept in our world. Maybe it can be applied to the heart. But essentially, in a patient who has no blood vessels, which you can identify in the foot, you essentially attach the artery to the vein, and you use the veins to perfuse the foot. And there are some fundamental biological questions here. What happens to these blood vessels over time? The main supply in blood vessel eventually fails, but the foot continues to be perfused. And so the basic science questions are, do you truly get arterialization of a venous complex? Can you then use this complexity of these big to small veins to create arteries to perfuse areas that are otherwise you know, non-salvageable. And so uh, the nice thing is that nobody in the world really has the same capability we have to try and analyze what is actually going on with these blood vessels. And Trisha has really taken that on. Thank you for all her collaborators. And then, of course, we, you know, the, this all comes down really to big data. And Karam's group had really been instrumental in helping to look at some of the, uh, analyze some of the uh, imaging that we're getting and some of the markers which we're starting to look at. This has resulted... And Trisha has just been told that her NIH grant has been funded. It's a $2 million NIH grant. She's already got $300,000 coming out of American Heart. So I think you can see how these, and, and your second R1, understand, has already been submitted. So I think you can see how an initial investment, as Dirk talked about, can convert into being able to pull this stuff out of that. And I'm not going to go on through it. So the names of our collaborators are up there in a variety of different organizations. Please feel free to talk to Trisha if it's something you're interested in. Eric is sitting in the front row, and, and Eric is an example of you, one of the busiest clinicians that we've got. How on earth do you essentially get him to do basic science at the same time? Well, you line him up with a very effective uh, postdoc. Where's Bright? Is Bright sitting in the audience? Stick your hand up if you're here. If you're not here, yeah, you go. So, so Bright, Bright by name, Bright by nature, um, has been working with Eric really for the past couple of years. He's been so successful, we actually recruited him into the vascular surgery training program, so he's going to convert from being a postdoc, uh, he's done a great job uh, into um, working with us and keeping him around for the next five years. Eric basically focuses on dialysis access. Nah, that sounds kind of boring, but it's not. If you think about it as a biological entity, it is the, this is the most aggressive new and old hyperplasia generating model that has ever been created. And it's likely that a lot of the lessons we can learn from neonal hyperplasia in the dialysis circuit could be translated into the coronaries or the lower extremities or things like that. My first time grant was really purely focused on looking at this. And they've been very active in looking, at, and I would say that he won the postdoc, year of the, uh, postdoc of the Year Award here last year. He and Bray has got multiple different accolades and won multiple different prizes as he's presented really around the country. So kudos to that. And these are just an example of some of the publications that came out of it. But what I wanted to do was really focus on this, because this is an example of product development. Um, this was a product, I think, was developed initially up in Nashville, but the investigators moved down to TMC. This is a little startup company. It's called the Venus Stand. Basically, the idea is you, you put an external scaffold on the anastomosis to see whether it changes the flow patterns and changes the hyperplasia. 
So they moved down to Texas Medical Center. They linked up really with Eric. A lot of the basic science of this preclinical stuff was done in the labs upstairs. That has now moved forward, and that company has got funding. You can see here $16 million in funding, and that now moves into a phase one clinical trial, and Eric is going to be the principal investigator on that. These first cases will be done here. And so it's one of the reasons that we want to be in that ecosystem of these preclinical companies who are looking for partners. And Homer, uh, is, is, who runs Vasier Center for Rapid Device Translation, sometimes it's not that rapid, but we're working on trying to make it a little bit more rapid, you know, is the key center point who can help make the links to try and move this forward. And this uh, company essentially came through that entire process. And these are some of the other ongoing collaborators who are now helping to look, for example, neonal hyperplasia, what makes these grafts fail. Maham Rahimi is another member of our group. Now, Maham is an MD, PhD. Uh, Trish is an MD, PhD. Uh, Maham, his background is in nanotechnology. And so what he has done is interfaced with a bunch of engineers, particularly out of the NMED program. NMED is a huge opportunity for the folks in the heart center. And the reason I want to feature uh, Maham, because I think the discussion should be, how on earth has he done this? He doesn't have a lab, he's got a mind, and he wants to be a busy clinical surgeon, but he does spend time in figuring out who an NMED he can actually work with. Here's what we're looking at. Treatment of your organ them to change. Now we put in endographs. Well, they get infected. Then you got to take them out. That's a nightmare scenario. And some of these have what we call bare metal stents, which go above the renal arteries. You can't really open the aorta up there very easily. And so there are a variety of different techniques, all of them pretty traumatic, by which you try to disengage these hooks really from the aorta. This is and so illustration. This was identified as a clinical problem. Can you run that? Yeah. And so how on earth can we help the device in we used to cut off syringes, thread it around the aorta, thread the sharp end up, you know, to try and disconnect these barbs, which are sticking through. If you just rip the just rip the aorta off. And so Baham, with those engineers, sat buttons, came up with a concept, patents already applied. After the endograft is placed into the devices. And developed these this rollers, which we slowly disengage the wall of the aorta. And that's kind of what it looks like. This, this is the preclinical testing. You got to have all these different testing mechanisms. That's an agar plate in which they're looking to see how much trauma it occurs. So there is, a, number one, these students, we want to make sure that we get our fair share of the pie in dealing with them inside of the heart and vascular center. You need to spend a little bit of time, you need to define a clinical problem, and they'll be with you really for a couple of years. And by and large, they're, fl they're free. Maham presented the V Symposium is probably the biggest vascular meeting of the year. And this guy, along with the, uh, the students that he's been working with, won the first two out of three awards that were, were, were given there. He also, because of identifying a clinical problem, groin infection, developed with students from A&M, developed a app by which you can plug in the risk factors preoperatively. It will give you an idea of what your risks are and how we should actually modify this. And this model that he developed for training people, again, using Mighty, uh, for treating aortic aneurysms is another example of something that won the prize up there. So if I, I want to finish off really before we go to the Bookout Center, talking about Mike Rear. And I mean, we already heard about structural heart. Mike was an example of someone who gave everything the heart team. This really started with Reardon, Kleinman, and Lilla pulling this thing together. Sasha Golems now is one of the fundamental drivers in this. That coalition has been absolutely fundamental. Being involved in these early phase clinical trials that define the future of TAVR, which leads on to mitral valve and tricuspid valve and all of the other things. Had we not been in that, none of this would happen. And if you look at this, this is like six New England Journal publications that come out really from this group really in the past few years. I don't think that's been done anywhere else in this organization by any other group. Lastly, I'm going to finish off with an opportunity for all of us, and that is the Bookout Center. Stuart Corr, Stuart, wave your arm up in the air. Help us. You can, the nice thing about this city is that you can spend a year of your life applying to get an NH grant and get nothing. You know, the opportunity is around the philanthropy that occurs in this city is you paint a vision, you get in front of these donors, and this led to about $13.5 million donation in which we're going to create the Bookout Center. This is primarily going to be around education. Mighty has now been rolled into this. 
But my focus of this is on imaging and robotics. Robots will take you to this level. Imaging will take you to this level. Fusing these two things together to use the preoperative images to guide the robots, this will take us into the next century. We're very powerful on the imaging side. We're very powerful clinically on the robotic side. We've not really had this um, mechanical engineering, computational science infrastructure. That's really what we're building. The space being built up and mighty. We'll show you all the different aspects of this, uh, where this is going to be centered. Uh, we're looking for a lead mechanical engineer who works in imaging and robotics. We think we've got you know, someone that we've got in mind and we're starting to reach out to try and recruit them. But I think this is a huge opportunity for everyone here. I got into this idea of robotics through Miguel Valderrama. He was working with a catheter robot to do afibrillation. And walking into an EP lab and seeing somebody in a beating heart apply an enormous amount of force to the wall of the atrium and say, I'm going to move it two millimeters to the right. That's a level of control that doesn't exist. And although the catheter robots have moved into the endobronchial space, same catheter robot that Miguel was using was bought by a company called Auris and converted into an endobronchial robot. It's all about, and as they say in the oil and gas business, all about working through long, thin tubes. They saw a much easier regulatory pathway in the endobronchial space you know, than in the endovascular space, but it's going to come back. That company was sold to J&J for $4 billion. Integrating imaging, pre-op CT scan, the lung nodule, into a patient lying in an operating room with an endobronchial robot is how 90% of these biopsies are being done now. It's going to come back into the endovascular space, and we're, you know, and we're very interested in doing this. Karam salivates when we talk about robots. Robots generate data. And so one of the things we've always struggled in surgery is how do you judge a good surgeon? We kind of look at him. You've got to stand there and say, hey, it looks pretty good. Every movement with a robot is data that's coming out the backside of this. And so this institution is very well poised to start doing, you know, how good are you? How can we improve it? When we worked with the catheter robots, Neil, for example, we, we put Neil on uh, taking a, a wire that he would have to navigate through a series of stenosis. We could measure that, how much forward pushing that guide wire, how fast the seed rotate it. All of that is now measured. So the idea is if you put somebody on one of these robots, we could do climbing mode to try and take somebody who's average to an expert using predetermined uh, robotic movements. And this is, you know, all moving. Uh, you, these are, this is what's coming up in, in the, um, uh, the book out center. Uh, you're going to hear a lot more about this, you know, in the near future. Um, we're very interested in engaging across the board with the imaging uh, group here and converting some of that basically into robotics. Uh, Austin is a new hire. Uh, he's interested in extended reality. We're, we're very excited to show you the, some of the stuff that he's been working on. We bought the Apple Vision Pro, and I'll show you an example of what this can look like. This is our conference room and what you can see through an Apple Vision Pro. And so you can see these images have gone from being pretty cartoonish-like to now something that really starts to look good. We can also put this in our Mightyverse, which is essentially Mighty built in VR. And now you can potentially, we're going to try this basically with Andrea Quarty, you know, in complex adult congenital heart problems, can you interact basically with people around the world who can help you look at it? And so this, I think this is, we have these platforms already built. Um, you can even do a knee replacement if you really want to. But this is the quality, you know, of the, the, the pictures that you're starting to get through these VR and AR, VR and AR headsets. So I want to just stop at that, showing you a number, number of these different examples. I want to finish off with, this is all great, but let me finish off with what's not so great. Uh, and that is, we have kind of lost our way a little bit in terms of how we're looking at aortic imaging. Uh, Marvin Atkins is here. He's the new director of aortic therapies. We have a huge track record in publishing our own dynamic MR. We defined a dynamic CT and how to use that to look at the aorta. When I talk to physicians, I say, no cardiac surgeon or cardiologist if you think of operating a mitral valve with a static image. We live in a very dynamic world. I live in a static world. That makes no sense. Aortic dissections are amongst the most dynamic structures and pathology that we deal with. We have led the way in defining dynamic imaging, 
part of the glue that's held this together basically was Ponraj, who was here as part of that Siemens relationship. We've kind of gotten away from that. And I think one of the challenges, you know, to the, the imaging group and to me and to Marvin is how do we put that back together and keep this going? Because we have an enormous track record in publishing and wrote aortic imaging. It's the best in class, but it ain't quite happening the way it should be. So thank you for the opportunity to do this, Bill. Thank you for putting this together. Um, I uh, took a different approach. Um, I would love to have uh, give an overview of what's going on in our setup, but uh, it's going to take an hour uh, to do that because we've got a lot of really good stuff going on. We'd love to do that. This year, we're going to probably double our federal support uh, and uh, extramural support uh, in terms of funding. And we've got a lot of uh, exciting things going on in the Center for RNA Therapeutics and the Center for uh, Vascular Regeneration, Cardiovascular Regeneration, and the Center for uh, Computational Biology and Bioinformatics. You're going to hear uh, more uh, about uh, the computational biology uh, this afternoon, and uh, you're going to hear more about uh, uh, the uh, uh, work we're doing in, in vascular biology. But um, I thought what I'd do is, is start to accelerate our movement toward talking about collaborations with my talk and uh, talk about how we can take uh, uh, an insight in, in cardiovascular biology and move it into the clinic. Well, what we found um, is uh, uh, something, I think it's analogous to uh, Kuram Nasser's power of zero. It's a concept that um, that uh, is not been accepted initially, um, but is gaining more credence. And I think we have an opportunity uh, to take this idea of uh, cell fate transition uh, in cardiovascular disease to the clinic. This uh, idea that uh, cell fate is dependent upon inflammatory signaling came from work that we did uh, a few years ago, published in Cell, where we showed that uh, uh, injury, uh, inflammation, uh, triggers uh, innate immune mechanisms that open up the chromatin. We're physicians. We deal with response to injury all the time. And uh, in the response to injury, you have this inflammatory signaling uh, that we're, we're all uh, aware of. Uh, what what we discovered was that inflammatory signaling opens up the chromatin so that the cells can have greater plasticity and change their cell fate in, in response to cues in the environment. So the key here is inflammatory signaling, epigenetic plasticity, and then providing the right environment for the cells to therapeutically change into what you need. Uh, we, we showed this first with, when we uh, showed that Yamanaka's approach to generating iPSCs uh, was re uh, what required this phenomenon of inflammatory signaling. So uh, Yamanaka got the Nobel Prize for, for generating iPSCs, pluripotent stem cells, and uh, what he didn't realize at the time was his retroviral vector uh, was half the story by inducing inflammatory signaling. I think this, this phenomenon is very important clinically. One of the things that we've uh, learned uh, in, our, uh, in cell culture and in our animal models is that this cell fate transition um, is uh, can be manipulated. So we have uh, in vitro taken fibroblasts, human fibroblasts, and we've altered them, uh, we've changed them into uh, endothelial cells simply by inducing inflammatory signaling and then putting the endothelial cell, uh, putting the cells, the fibroblasts, into an environment where they are, where, where uh, endothelial uh, cell fate transition is promoted. Uh, basically, it's uh, inflammatory signaling plus uh, endothelial growth factors. Now, this phenomenon occurs in limb ischemia as well. And um, so we've shown, uh, Shubong in the laboratory showed uh, a few years ago that uh, in the setting of ischemia, uh, there is a set of fibroblasts that is able to transdifferentiate into endothelial cells and expand the microvasculature. Uh, so this is a normal physiological response to, to ischemia. Uh, they, she used lineage tracing to show the fibroblasts are changing into endothelial cells. And single cell analyses disclosed that there were eight sets of fibroblasts in, in the limb, uh, two of which contributed to this phenomenon that we call angiogenic transdifferentiation. So this is an entirely new way to generate vessels, angiogenic transdifferentiation. It's cell fate transition, fibroblast transdifferentiating into endothelial cells. I think this phenomenon, it can, it can go both ways. And in, in, in inflammatory signaling with the wrong environment, with the wrong environmental milieu, you can get endothelial cells transdifferentiating into fibroblasts. Well, that causes non-ischemic heart failure. But the reverse 
is also true. We can therapeutically reverse this process. So that's what I'd like to work with. I'd like to work with the vascular group on. I'd like to work with the heart failure group on this idea. Um, so uh, Lily's going to talk later today. Uh, she's already talking to Trish about the possibility of uh, doing this uh, work together to understand uh, what uh, role this plays in uh, critical limb ischemia. So the, the patients with critical limb ischemia or CLTI, uh, those patients get, uh, can get uh, ulcers. And I think uh, the reason for that is that this process is impaired. That's the hypothesis. So um, if we can uh, manipulate this process, we can maybe reverse uh, the uh, uh, critical limb, limb ischemia, at least uh, reverse the uh, ulcerations, maybe heal the ulcerations by reversing this process. Um, there's, we found that there's a Goldilocks zone for this inflammatory signaling and uh, the, uh, the uh, chromatin accessibility. If there's too much inflammation, we actually get less chromatin accessibility. If there's not enough uh, inflammatory signaling, we also don't get chromatin accessibility. So we see this clinically. Patients that are on steroids can't heal. And we've shown that this process is, is inhibited by steroids. Patients that have excessive inflammation don't heal. Think about the patients with the critical limb scheme. They have a ring of inflammation around their ulcer. And what do you do? You go in and, and you remove that. You, you d d debride it and remove that excessive uh, inflammation. And then the, the wound can heal. So um, this is something that we would like to work with you on. So Lily's going to talk about this uh, later today and uh, talk about uh, her plans to work with uh, Trish Roy on this, this phenomenon. This phenomenon occurs in heart failure. And uh, what we're learning is that uh, non-ischemic heart failure is due to the cell fate transition endothelial to fibroblast trans differentiation that causes the fibrosis and the loss of microvascular uh, space. And then, but it's reversible. And uh, we um, learned this from the, the early work that uh, Keith Euchre did with Arvind Bimaraj, uh, uh, showing that there are double stained cells in the patients with uh, the post LVAD patients. And uh, it suggested that there was some sort of cell there that was undergoing a transition. Um, and uh, what you see in, these, in the patients uh, uh, pre LVAD is you see a lot of fibrosis. Paravascular fibrosis is shown in this slide uh, of the myocardium, and then uh, interstitial fibrosis throughout the heart. And uh, that is reversible. post alvet we see less of that, and uh, we see greater vascularity. And we think that this process involves an expansion of the microvasculature due to androgenic transdifferentiation. And uh, a lot of work now are preparing a, a, a paper for uh, Nature Medicine. Uh, showing that this process is occurring in the heart, in human heart, as well as uh, the mouse model that uh, Keith has uh, generated. So in Keith's uh, mouse model of heart failure, he gives up uh, factors that induce heart failure, angiotensin II and a high-salt uh, diet and L-name, which inhibits NO production. And you get this fibrosis occurring in the heart that mimics the, um, our patients that are in severe heart failure that require LVAD. And uh, then... The drugs are stopped, and the animals recover. And similarly to the post-LVAD patients. The post-LVAD post patients recover. There's less fibrosis and increased microvascular density. And he, they've, uh, he and uh, Rajul Ranka have demonstrated that uh, there is, in fact, an expansion of the microvasculature. So here's uh, some histology showing the, the phenomenon. Uh, normal heart in the uh, upper left corner. Uh, the heart as a, a during heart failure. This is a mouse model of heart failure. Uh, so you see this interstitial fibrosis and a reduction in the vascularity. You stop those drugs and the heart recovers. The cardiac function recovers. And what you see microscopically is you see uh, an increase in, in microvascularity and you see a reduction in fibrosis. And that's shown in the histograms to the right. Um, what uh, we've shown more, most recently is that uh, perfusion is also in, uh, increased using the microsphere beads. So this phenomenon is reversible. This uh, uh, heart failure uh, is really a, a problem at the microvascular level. Um, Lily's done uh, uh, lineage tracing studies to show, in fact, that this cell fate transition is occurring, that uh, fibroblasts are transdifferentiating into endothelial cells. And uh, in the human tissue, uh, we've done RNA velocity uh, 
first of all, single uh, cell RNA seq uh, studies with uh, Guan Yu Wang and uh, shown that uh, the uh, pre LVAD uh, endothelial cells have this tendency by RNA velocity to become fibroblasts. That's shown in the panel uh, to the right, uh, the, the two right hand panels. Um, pre LVAD, uh, there's a tendency for endothelial cells to become fibroblasts, and then post LVAD, the fibroblasts. Uh, RNA velocity suggests that they're uh, trying to become endothelial cells. There's this tendency. So this is human tissue, pre and post uh, LVAD, that uh, Keith has collected. And uh, then Rajul Ronka in, in the laboratory has actually taken non-myocytes from the heart. So she's isolated pieces of pre and post LVAD heart, uh, rinsed them up, isolated the cells, uh, looked at the uh, fibroblasts and endothelial cells together in cell culture, and saw something remarkable. Uh, from from these human tissues. First of all, uh, the uh, pre-LVAD non-myocytes grow very poorly. They, they're acting like they're senescent. So this is a, a growth uh, diagram. Uh, we're looking at impedance. This is an impedance technique to look at cell proliferation. In blue are the pre-LVAD non-myocytes. They're sick. And when we stain them for senescent markers, they're senescent. So uh, in, in heart failure, your, your non-myocytes that are supporting the heart are senescent. That's a bad thing because senescent cells make inflammatory cytokines that make all the cells around them sick. Um, then uh, post-LVAD, that they recover. So these are the same patients, pre- and post-LVAD, non-myocytes, the vascular cells, the fibroblasts are recovering. And here's the interesting thing. Pre-LVAD, you can see this in, in the uh, uh, cells to the right, the, the um, histology, uh, rather the uh, light microscopy to the right. Pre-LVAD, uh, the cells look primarily fibroblastic. And as they grow, they, there's very few endothelial cells. So standing here for CD144 and uh, COL1A. And post-LVAD, we see a lot more endothelial cells and they're forming vascular networks in spontaneously in culture. Uh, so this phenomenon of cell fate transition can be observed in, in cell culture. Um, so we uh, wanted to take a, a close look at that uh, with, uh, with, with you, with the uh, heart failure group and with the, uh, with the uh, vascular group. Again, here's some of those vascular networks shown. Uh, so um, that's just a start to get us going into the afternoon. We're going to be talking, or later this morning, we'll be talking about uh, possible collaborations. Uh, you're going to hear from Guan Yu Wang about his Thor uh, algorithm. Uh, Guan Yu has uh, developed this computational algorithm to mesh transcriptional, uh, spatial transcriptomics with histology uh, so that you can look at a uh, 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 histological slide and actually understand what those cells are making without doing the spatial transcriptomics. So he's going to talk about that. And I think the, the, the big idea is that at some point to mesh all of that so you get the spatial transcriptomics, you get the histology, and you get the clinical imaging. So you can do a clinical image and understand what cells are composing that, uh, you know, that structure. Uh, and then we're also going to hear from uh, Francisco and uh, Dr. Valder Abino about their collaborations this afternoon. So I, I thought I would just uh, focus on one area where we might collaborate, Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Um, I think by now, within 45 minutes, truly, we've had a, an overview of the topics, the areas of interest, maybe where we could be going in different ways. And uh, it really is amazing, actually, the amount of work that goes on and the breadth and the depth of the, these various investigations. So I cannot thank you enough, meaning the investigators, the fellows, the trainees, the postdocs, the PhDers, uh, all of you. So let me tell you what we have in mind now, okay? So go take a break and visit, you know, the posters. They're there. I want you to interact among yourselves and with the poster presenters. Ask them any questions. Find maybe new pathways for your collaboration. And we'll come back at 11 o'clock. So you can have a... I'm sorry? Yes. But we'll come back at 11 o'clock and have two sessions. The first session is on big data and how do you mine it with a panel discussion? How do you collaborate clinically? And the other one is basic sciences, clinical collaboration. So 
And then after that, we'll announce, so don't go, we'll announce our winners for, for the various abstracts. So, and then you can go. So that, that's the plan. Adam. Thank you. Well, first of all, great session, Bill. Thank you. Uh, let, me, let me address the postdocs and the, the basic scientists here. Clinicians, I'll speak as a surgeon. We're a very frustrating group to work with. Uh, we, we get that. And, and part of that is you know, our life is not our own. Okay, we're On the clinical side, and you say to me, let's meet at 10 o'clock, and I got a case, and it gets delayed, and it doesn't start till 9.30, and I can't get to that meeting. That's a challenge, okay? I, so that does not mean we're not interested in what you're doing. We, you are profoundly important. We are all in this because we're in academics, and you can help us achieve our mission. Uh, and so I, I would ask you to have, you know, bear with us as we go through these the lack of turning up or canceling meetings does not mean lack of interest. And hopefully creating a forum like this and totally indebted to Bill and doing this as a way of which it's about relationships and getting to know one another so that you know basically how important you are to us and we can kind of rearrange these meetings at the last minute without destroying the whole program. But thank you again. Thanks, Bill, for doing this and thank you for your indulgence.